So the lecture uh, to this, e this afternoon is about uh, planet formation, uh, principally, and I'm going to focus on giant planet formation today and terrestrial planet formation tomorrow. Uh, giant planets, even though we don't think of them as places that would be sites for life, of course play two important roles uh, with respect to life. One of them is that they might host satellites, which themselves could have life. And the other is that giant planets, being giant, can affect by their dynamics the stability of terrestrial planets and also uh, can literally uh, focus material to the terrestrial planets, either inward of them or outward from them, uh, that would create uh, a substantial rate of impacts which will affect the habitability of the terrestrial planets. So one should care in the subject of astrobiology about giant planets. They are important and uh, understanding how they form is important. So I'll make some general considerations about star and planet formation. Then I'll talk about um, briefly mechanisms of how clouds collapse. I'm going to do this more because it's interesting uh, for one possible mechanism for giant planet formation and less for the, the process of collapse itself uh, to form the star and the disk, although this is an interesting problem also in astrophysics. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about properties of disks. We'll then get into giant planet formation, planet migration, and I'm going to close, even though it's not on this outline, with um, a, an alternative way of dating the age of Saturn, uh, which uh, I hope will si uh, stimulate some discussion. So in order to have that discussion going, I want to finish by uh, 540 uh, so that we have 10 minutes for discussion. Uh, I know I ended a few minutes late this morning. So if I promise to end at 540, you promise to ask lots of provocative questions. OK, good. So this is um, one of many plots summarizing, and this is now an old plot from 2009. Uh, the mass versus semi-major axis of the known uh, planets, solar and extrasolar. The solar system planets are here in black diamonds. Extrasolar planets are shown in various colors and shapes associated with the means by which they were discovered. And these are log-log uh, plots so a planet, the mass of Jupiter is here, and uh, this is in fact the mass of Jupiter. This is Jupiter right here, sitting at five astronomical units from the Sun. Uh, here is the Earth, uh, about one three hundredth the mass of Jupiter, sitting at exactly one astronomical unit. Now what you see is almost a continuum with the possible exception of a, a void here that is a little bit difficult to explain as an observational effect. Uh, other than that, uh, which actually runs, uh, these are massive bodies now, 10 Jupiter masses or more, uh, semi-major axes between, oh, about um, point, uh, this should be point 0.1, by the way, uh, between about point 0.03 and one astronomical unit. And it may be that these massive bodies are simply too massive uh, to really be stable in that region. But other than that, you see a continuum of bodies, and you notice that the dots change from blue to purple as we cross this magic line that I've drawn here on the graph at about 13 Jupiter masses, in fact. Uh, the purple ones here are the objects that have been discovered by direct imaging. Uh, they're large enough, luminous enough, and far enough away from their parent star that you can actually see them. And then the ones in blue are the famous uh, hundreds of planets that have been discovered by the radial velocity technique. The total number of planets, I would remind you, uh, is something in, in excess of 530 planets, plus uh, hundreds and hundreds of more planetary candidates uh, that have been uh, published by Kepler, but still require confirmation to be real planets. Okay. So what is this magic line? Well, this magic line is to start the debate about what is a planet and what is a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is the traditional name for an object that um, is a star but does not burn uh, hydrogen, doesn't undergo hydrogen fusion. And uh, traditionally, the boundary between uh, normal main sequence stars and planets uh, 
is set at about 80 times the mass of Jupiter, uh, which is in here. Uh, and uh, that's the threshold for a solar composition object uh, to have a high enough temperature in its interior to fuse hydrogen into helium. There's another limit at 13 Jupiter masses where deuterium uh, can undergo fusion. And that requires, of course, lower temperatures and therefore lower pressures and lower masses. So one way to define the upper boundary of a planet is to say that a planet doesn't undergo, uh, doesn't fuse anything in its interior, uh, deuterium, uh, let alone hydrogen. And that limit would be 13 times the mass of Jupiter. Uh, this is not too far away from various theoretical limits having to do with uh, the collapse of objects uh, in disks, direct collapse to uh, form planetary objects. Uh, as we'll talk about with disks, uh, typically uh, trying to get something that's more than 10 or 20 times the mass of Jupiter to form in the disk is a, is a difficult thing to do unless the disk is very, very massive and effectively fragments into a binary star. Uh, so perhaps this limit, which I've drawn here based on what one can call the fusion criterion, which really is well-defined and absolute, although somewhat arbitrary, might also serve for the uh, process of formation, let's say. Uh, but that's certainly less clear. Nonetheless, uh, I think it's safe to say that we all think of planets as things that are 10 or 20 times the mass of Jupiter or smaller. Objects above that are brown dwarfs. Uh, they're quite self-luminous for billions and billions of years, of course. And then at the 80 Jupiter mass, uh, 0.08 solar mass threshold, one has the stars. So how do stars and planets form? Well, stars and planets form uh, from the debris of previous generations of stars, uh, as well as hydrogen that um, for some reason has not made it into stars, although there's very little of that. Uh, in our galaxy. Uh, and so giant molecular clouds, <clears throat> uh, such as you see here, a part of the Orion molecular cloud complex, uh, are places where material is available for the formation of stars. And the environment is such that there is the potential for forming stars by collapse of uh, gas and dust. And in particular, in regions like this, uh, which are not only very colorful, but also very complex, one can imagine that there is a wide range of possible environments for chemistry, as I talked about this morning, and places where things get cold enough and dense enough that uh, collapse might actually proceed. Planets almost certainly form in disks, although one has to say that it's not clear how the pulsar planets form. Uh, but the disk formation model, which was originally um, inspired, I suppose you could say, by trying to understand our own solar system, uh, Descartes and Laplace both talked about it, seems to be a sensible model, uh, even though extrasolar planetary systems uh, do have a much wider range of eccentricities and even inclinations uh, relative to our own solar system. But disks are very common. Uh, disks are observed around uh, pre-main sequence stars uh, containing lots of gas. There's a definite progression uh, of uh, disk occurrence uh, versus stellar age, which seems to indicate uh, a typical lifetime for the gas. And then there's ample evidence of transitional disks, which are ones where um, the, the gas seems to have largely gone away uh, and there's large amounts of dust all the way to residual disks where there is a much more tenuous amount of dust. And in fact, even in our own solar system, we can think of um, the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt as, as remnant disks uh, with some dust population in them. Of course, there's the zodiacal dust as well, which has to be continuously regenerated because that material is, is swept away and also swept inward to the sun. But um, it's very hard to get around this now. And of course, if you go back to astronomy books from the 1940s and the 1950s, um, the disk model was not very popular because no one could quite figure out how a disk could contain only a tenth of a percent of the mass of the sun, 
that's basically the mass of Jupiter and then the other planets, but carry most of the angular momentum. Turned out that it required um, understanding uh, processes like generations of, of waves, spiral density arms, uh, turbulence in disks, and so on. Uh, not a lot of work really was done on that until the 1960s uh, when a number of people, Lyndon Bell and Pringle, for example, come to mind, were able to work out the dynamics of disks. And then it became, began to be understood how mass could be swept inward to the protostar and angular momentum could be moved outward. Of course, in the 40s and 50s, in place of the disk model, uh, we had this tidal stripping model where a star dramatically passed very close to the sun early in its lifetime and pulled this stream of material out which magically condensed like little pearls into the planets of our solar system and also magically managed to go into circular orbits around the sun uh, without any other interactions with massive bodies. And, uh, you know, we can all kind of giggle about it now, but it's always in hindsight that you look at models and say, how could they think of such a thing? Uh, you know, it's much easier to, to work on the question of disk dissipation than try to get nine bodies that have been pulled out tidally to go into circular orbits around the sun. Um, anyway, this is Fomalhaut, uh, and this is a debris disk. There's a planet uh, orbiting Fomalhaut. This is five seconds of arc. Uh, this is a long way out. I forget what this is in astronomical units. I'm sure somebody here knows what it is. This is an inset. I'm sorry it's been cut off. This is the planet in 2004 and the same object in 2005, clearly in Keplerian orbit and not simply a background object. So planets form in disks, and there is leftover debris that remains from that process. So how do disks form? Well, molecular clouds uh, contain areas that have um, higher density than the, than the average value. Um, the, uh, in these regions, um, a number of effects are taking place that tend to encourage the further densification of these objects. Uh, one is simply that relatively cold um, clumps uh, can simply spontaneously collapse uh, if they have uh, a large enough mass, the so-called genes mass criterion. Um, another possibility is that some of these clumps are magnetically supported and uh, they're supported because they have a population of charged particles of ions which, uh, because magnetic fields from the galaxy thread through these clouds are basically supported because they're forced to, to, to spiral around the magnetic field lines. But if for whatever reason this clump gets a little bit uh, denser, the, the fraction of material that's in the form of ions begins to decrease and so the magnetic support decreases, so it contracts a little more, and so you get a decrease further in the ion population. And being here in the mountains, a very evocative way to think of this is you've lost your grip on the cliff and you start to slide, and because of that you start to slide even more and even more, and then that's it. Unless you're Wiley Coyote, in which case you survive. Um, so. Loss of magnetic support is one way for these disks to, um, uh, for these clumps to collapse. Now, in this little set of cartoons from Gene Levy, which are more symbolic than anything else, uh, you see a, a clump that is starting to collapse. Uh, and what Gene is trying to suggest here is um, a certain amount of uh, vorticity in this clump. Molecular clouds, of course, have a large extent, hundreds of light years or more in a few cases and they're subject to rotation around the galactic center. So because of that rather large extent, they naturally have some Keplerian shear associated with them. And those clumps then um, uh, see that shear as a kind of a vorticity, so they have an angular momentum associated with them, with them. The angular momentum more or less is conserved so that when the clump uh, goes from uh, the size of, let's say, a, a parsec, to something the size of our solar system, 100 astronomical units, uh, the conservation of angular momentum dictates that the angular velocity gets very large and the material has to spin out in the form of a disk. Once it begins to do that, material falls down onto the disk as shown here. The disk itself can be turbulent. Uh, the disk also has a Keplerian shear associated with the gas. We're looking at it from the side in B. 
we're looking at it uh, from the top down, essentially in D. Uh, and this shear uh, does two things. Uh, it causes mass to move inward while moving the angular velocity or, or angular momentum outward. Uh, this is simply dissipation. But it also, because the dissipation is larger where the Keplerian motion is greater, results in a larger temperature toward the center and a lower temperature further out with a temperature gradient that's quite a bit steeper than what you would expect from simple radiative equilibrium with the central star. If it were just in radiative equilibrium with the star, the, the, um, the uh, temperature would fall off as, as one over the square root of the distance. But in uh, many of these disks uh, where you can determine the temperatures, uh, one sees larger gradients, one over the distance or even one over the distance to the 1.5 power, uh, which is a signature of viscous dissipation, of processes that are generating uh, much more dissipation and therefore thermal energy toward the center of the disk than toward the outer edge of the disk. Okay, so um, now looking at this a little bit more quantitatively, um, one criterion for, for collapse is the genes mass, and uh, this comes from uh, simply writing uh, the, uh, the gravitational energy uh, minus that is twice the kinetic energy. Writing uh, this kinetic energy then uh, in terms of the thermal energy uh, for a gas uh, that's composed of atoms or molecules, either one. Uh, <clears throat> and then coming up with um, this uh, criterion, minimum criterion for collapse associated with the virial theorem. Uh, which is given by uh, this equation here, where m sub j is the genes mass, the minimum mass for collapse, uh, kt over g mu m, where m is the uh, mass of the hydrogen, mu is the molecular weight, rho is the density of the gas, t is the temperature, and g is the, um, is the gravity. Um, now this, again, this criterion is, is actually not so useful in molecular clouds because uh, for example, magnetic stresses can maintain uh, clumps uh, above the mass of, above the genes mass. Uh, and conversely, if a supernova explosion occurs within the cloud, which uh, does occur because clouds like Orion have uh, a large population of very massive short-lived stars, then compression can occur, which can essentially create a wave of collapse and create a burst of star formation. So this is a kind of fiducial mark, but it isn't really clear whether it's telling you the minimum mass or just some sort of nominal case for an isolated clump of gas. This is more interesting and more relevant for the p possible formation of giant planets by direct collapse, not in a clump of material, but in the disk itself, the gaseous disk that's formed from the clump, uh, where in that case the density is orders of magnitude higher than it is in the molecular cloud clump. And so there, instead of getting genes masses that are on the order of stellar masses, in the case of, of the protoplanetary disk itself, as I'll talk about, uh, one can arrive at genes masses that uh, are in fact comparable to, or just a few times, the mass of Jupiter. And so the notion that a dense and cold and therefore unstable disk could directly collapse and produce giant planets uh, provides one of the two alternative models uh, today for giant planet formation. Okay, and then um, the other thing that one can quantify here is the centrifugal radius, which once you get a clump collapsing, uh, is the final size based on conservation of angular momentum. Here L is the angular momentum of the clump. Here's the mass of the clump, the initial size, which can be set at one parsec, and the initial spin, which could really be any value pretty much from uh, zero, in which case you will end up with just a single star. Uh, or it could be large enough that the disk actually breaks up and you get a binary system. Um, so this is a value that is poorly specified. L is the final, uh, the, the same angular momentum, uh, but now the clump, the mass is preserved, the final size is little r, and omega is the final spin, which is obviously going to have to be much larger uh, 
in magnitude than the initial spin. Uh, and omega, if we're talking about a disk that's in Keplerian rotation, is given by the square root of g times the mass divided by uh, the extent uh, cubed, the radius cubed. Uh, so we can go ahead and equate the two angular uh, momenta because we assume that's conserved and we come up with what's called the centrifugal radius uh, which depends on the initial size very very strongly uh, depends strongly on the initial spin omega and then on the mass of the disk. This sort of argument is used to justify 100 AU as the size of a typical protostellar disk although to justify this you have to have a good number for omega which you can get from kind of typical shears in uh, a molecular cloud that's orbiting at uh, sort of a middle distance in the galaxy. Um, I prefer to say that we know that 100 AU is the right answer for, for many systems because you can actually image dust disks and so instead you can kind of use this criterion to decide what the initial spins were uh, in, the, in the cloud or in the clump, in the cloud itself. Um, now again, the observational evidence suggests that a very good fraction of stars, maybe half of stars, uh, low mass stars at least, end up with disks, at least transiently. Uh, not all do, and again, um, others uh, often produce binary star systems where the angular momentum is simply too large to provide a stable disk. But clearly, um, in many cases, one ends up with, uh, at least for a short period of time, uh, a, a gaseous disk that feeds the central star and uh, can potentially produce planets. Okay, so what do these disks look like? Um, here's uh, a sort of somewhat imaginative cutaway uh, that uh, I did many years ago. The protosun is in the center here. Uh, the temperature increases outward. What I failed to do in this model is to put in uh, the, the cavity which uh, there's good evidence now surrounds every protostar uh, while disk material is being processed uh, into it. And of course the bipolar flows are missing as well. Uh, but the disk is highly flared. Uh, there can even be um, not only the bipolar flow but there can be nebular coronal flares associated with bursts of accretion. Material is infalling from the giant molecular cloud. Uh, there are shocks, as I mentioned this morning, at the disk edge, which will process uh, the grains, uh, vaporize um, the grains uh, inward of uh, 10 astronomical units, typically. And so, um, in the inner part of this disk, uh, and this has a, a sort of a convex shape to it, because this chemically active zone is driven by the temperature, uh, basically a threshold at which reaction rates become fast enough as you move inward that they dominate over dynamical transport of material. Uh, and so uh, the disk midplane being the hottest, this region is going to be the farthest from the central star. Uh, but this chemically active zone is where carbon monoxide and methane uh, convert between each other, also with CO2. Um, nitrogen, N2, and ammonia interconvert as well. Uh, sulfur uh, compounds will exchange sulfur between one between the other and so this is a region where if you were to examine the gas it should be roughly in chemical equilibrium with this boundary being different for different classes of reactions different for the carbon bearing species different for the nitrogen bearing species different for the sulfur bearing species um, and then uh, further out uh, the temperatures are low enough that if the disk is turbulent what dominates is not equilibrium chemistry, but kinetically driven chemistry, where material uh, it comes to a, a partial equilibrium or does not come to equilibrium because it's transported from warmer regions out to colder regions, then gets transported back again and the chemistry starts up again. So here one has to take account of the rates of reactions and what are the limiting steps in these reactions. Uh, the snow line, uh, as we move outward, the temperature drops. The snow line is the point at which water ice can condense out. Beyond the snow line, which is not a fixed point, but actually migrates inward with time and might even oscillate back and forth, uh, the snow line uh, is the point beyond which the amount of solid material available for accretion becomes dramatically larger than inward of the snow line because of the difference uh, 
in uh, elemental abundance of oxygen, which can make water ice, and silicon and magnesium, which are limited to making rocky material. So beyond the snow line is where solids really dominate. Uh, planetesimals will grow fairly rapidly uh, to what are now in the literature called planetary embryos, which are meant to be the size of the moon or Mars. Um, of course, if the disk is dense and very cold, it can collapse via the genes instability. Uh, turbulence probably will prevent this from happening. So bodies instead will end up colliding with each other, sticking, and uh, this process, at least up to the size of lunar sized bodies, is, is quite rapid throughout the disk. Um, the largest body at a given radius tends to grow the fastest, and this effect uh, actually becomes enhanced as the body gets bigger and has a large gravitational cross section. So this is called runaway accretion. What tends to stop this process is that the runaway growth becomes limited by the sphere of influence of the planet. So once it clears out the region around it, either tidally or just simply by sweeping up all the material, the growth rates begin to slow dramatically. And that's certainly the case in the inner part of the disk. I'll talk about terrestrial planet formation tomorrow. It's a problem for forming giant planets in a two-step process where you grow a core first and then collapse the gas on top. Because if the sphere of this largest body uh, becomes isolated too soon before the gas can collapse, then it will just sit there in this gaseous nebula. And when the gas goes away, it will be left with something that's perhaps the size of the Earth, uh, maybe even less. Uh, that's certainly the case inward of the snow line. Outward of the snow line, you can generally get to larger sized bodies before this isolation occurs. But even so, there are strong constraints on building a giant planet by solid accretion, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So let's focus on giant planet formation. There are two ways that have been developed in the literature, proposed in the literature, and worked on quantitatively for making a giant planet. One is called the nucleated instability or core formation model, and the other is called the gravitational instability model. The core formation model, which actually was first developed quantitatively by uh, Mitsuno in Japan in the 19, uh, late 1970s, actually Hayashi even before that, involves the buildup of a rocky core of material that becomes large enough that it attracts gas from the disk onto itself rapidly by gravitational attraction. And you end up, uh, in the case of, uh, of a sufficiently dense nebula and a sufficiently large core, attracting hundreds of Earth masses of gaseous material uh, onto this core and making a self-gravitating, uh, stable, giant planet. The other model is, um, uh, was actually uh, first uh, looked at uh, seriously by Al Cameron in the 1960s and 70s and then picked up again in the 1990s by Alan Boss. Uh, it's the direct gravitational collapse model, and here the disk is cold enough and quiescent enough so that there's no turbulence that effectively the genes mass criterion applies, and the disk simply self-fragments into a number of pieces, each of which is approximately the mass of a giant planet, and these then condense further and sort themselves out later dynamically. The rocky core, um, I, this is really a misnomer, this should be the rocky and icy core formation model, is slower, but um, it actually um, provides a detailed prediction of the properties of giant planets, including whether they have a heavy element core or not. And whether Jupiter and Saturn have he heavy element cores has been a debate that's gone back and forth, uh, in part because our understanding of the behavior of hydrogen and helium at high pressure is still incomplete. Uh, very recently, the most recent equation of state models tend to favor the idea, given what we know of the gravitational fields of Jupiter and Saturn, that they both have cores, uh, which would argue in favor of the core formation model. But we still don't know for sure, and it will take a mission called Juno, uh, which will arrive at Jupiter in 2016, to tell us definitively whether Jupiter has a core, and for Saturn, the Cassini orbiter, which is there now, 
is going to be uh, flown on a kind of a death spiral uh, in, within the innermost ring of Saturn many, many times before it's finally uh, immolated or burned up in Saturn's atmosphere in 2017. And during those very tight polar orbits, it also will be able to measure the gravitational field so exquisitely that we will know if Saturn has a core as well. Uh, so uh, then the gravitational instability model has the advantage that it's faster. Okay, so the core instability model basically depends on the fact that as a, a growing protoplanet, which really has to be ice and rock, grows, uh, the escape velocity increases. And you can scale this with the uh, escape velocity of the Earth, if you like. But when the escape velocity becomes larger than the sound speed of the gas, uh, potentially one can have an instability where not only can solid material escape, but the gas itself uh, begins to accrete very, very rapidly onto the growing core. And I like to talk about this if we're talking to astrophysicists as kind of the planetary scientist version of the black hole. Because in the case of the black hole, the escape velocity uh, exceeds the speed of light. And nothing can get out except for these pair-pair interactions that occur. Well, here this is not the speed of light, it's the sound speed. But you can imagine that if the escape velocity exceeds the sound speed, in order for gas to escape, it ends up uh, creating a large shock, which is very, very dissipative because the, the gas is trying to move at or faster than the sound speed. And so at that point, literally, it's very efficient to have accretion. Gas accretion becomes very, very fast. Uh, but that requires 10 Earth masses of material. You can calculate it depending on whether it's all rock or all ice. It's probably rock plus ice because that's the material in the outer solar system. And this must occur before the protoplanetary gas is dispersed, before the disk is dispersed. Uh, and uh, it also has to occur uh, in a gaseous medium that has the right opacity to kind of prevent this gas uh, from um, essentially getting so hot that it actually uh, thermally expands and pulls away from the growing core. So there are some criteria that have to be met. Um, there are a number of calculations. This is actually a relatively old one uh, from the Ames group showing how this works. This is mass relative to Earth masses versus time in millions of years. And the mass of the core is shown here as m sub z. The mass of the envelope of the hydrogen and helium gas is mxy, and the total mass of the planet is given by the long dash dot line. So here's planetesimal runaway growth until we get up to about 10 Earth masses. In this case, uh, the surface density of the nebula was high enough that one could get a 10 Earth mass object in a time scale of about a million years or so. And at that point, the gas accretion rate begins to increase uh, and adds to the total mass. And this, of course, is now a runaway. And finally, you get a very, very large increase until you can have something the mass of Saturn or even the mass of Jupiter. So that's how it works. And you end up with something like this. Um, and the constraint, of course, that we have to deal with is that most of the astronomical observations of young stellar objects all come to roughly the same conclusion that gaseous disks have a typical lifetime of 5 million years and certainly no more than 10 million years. This is one example from Fidele et al. Uh, from some uh, VLT observations of hydrogen alpha emission uh, from uh, various uh, uh, stars, young stars in, young, in, um, in molecular clouds uh, and um, uh, very young clusters. So this is uh, the number of stars with um, uh, the particular uh, hydrogen alpha excess that they used to suggest that gas accretion was still occurring versus age in millions of years. There are two different techniques here. But the bottom line is that the e-folding time here, and it looks almost like an exponential uh, decay, is something like three or four million years. And again, irrespective of any particular study, the, essentially all of the studies of young stellar objects come to the same conclusion, that if you haven't formed
a giant planet by about five million years, you really don't have the gas available to do it. You're stuck at that point. Um, and um, now that's all lovely, but the one thing we have to worry about, which uh, is uh, certainly very dramatically shown in this plot of mass versus semi-major axis for uh, extrasolar planets, uh, is that most of the giant planets that we actually see are not at distances that would correspond to the snow line, but are inward of it and are spread through this region. Now maybe they were able to form in place, but um, in fact what a plot like that tends to argue is that these bodies have migrated dramatically. And the question is, when have they actually migrated? So migration of planets is actually a big problem both for the formation of terrestrial planets and also for the formation of uh, giant planets. Type 1 migration is when a low mass planet uh, is formed, weakly perturbs the disk, but in fact for some uh, disk structures that you can have very, very rapid migration inward of uh, these objects in 10 to the 4 years. Uh, type 2 migration involves a bigger planet opening a gap in the disk, a similar time scale. The bottom line is that um, it may be that the appropriate time scale for uh, forming these objects is not 10 to the 6 years, but has to be 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 years, unless there's some way to prevent migration from occurring. And this is a kind of an unsolved problem in, um, uh, in, uh, in the core accretion model, to be frank. Um, migration is a way of forming giant planets at small radii, but why did the migration stop? How are these semi-major axes distributed over a wide range? Uh, and um, can you really get core accretion to occur quickly enough that uh, you can then get to the phase of gas accretion uh, before this planet spirals in? One way around excessive migration uh, is offered, uh, this is by John Chambers, uh, that if you can maintain a large population of small planetesimals, uh, it's possible, this is a case where the mean planetesimal size is 100 meters, it's possible to get bodies that are in Earth mass or more in size on time scales of between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 years. That is, the accretion rate uh, is is quick enough, is, is fast enough to uh, avoid uh, complete migration uh, for small planetesimals. Now whether this makes sense in protoplanetary disks or not is also still an open question. <coughs> the disk instability model is dramatically different. The disk is quiescent, uh, it's not turbulent, uh, it's massive enough and cold enough that spiral density waves form quite quickly and one gets a population of fragments that are in the order of a Jupiter mass or more after absurdly short time scales of 10 to the 3 years. This is from Mayer et al. in 2002 and this is a more recent model by Boley and Durison in 2010 where you see seven giant planet mass objects formed on a time scale of uh, 2,000 years. Now, these are not giant planets. The densities here are, if you um, uh, look at the scale that's shown down here, large, but they're orders of magnitude less than what's needed to, to, to say you have a giant planet. So this is only a part of the process. Um, nonetheless, it's somewhat appealing because if you form a lot of giant planets in this way, one of the things that they can do is then dynamically interact with each other after the gas is gone and create a distribution of orbital eccentricities that, as Yurik and Tremaine argued, uh, is quite similar to the observed eccentricity distribution of exoplanets. So this is a kind of a weird statistical measure of the eccentricity function of uh, the frequency of the eccentricity versus the eccentricity itself. Here's the data. Um, and uh, yeah, here's the data. Here are some models in various colors. The bottom line is if you, end, if you have a lot of giant planets, meaning four or five or six, uh, in a disk, once they form, they will dynamically interact. Uh, 
Some of them will be ejected and the rest will be left with a distribution of eccentricities that's not all that different from uh, what is observed to date. So that's an argument in favor of the disk instability model, even though it doesn't seem to explain the properties of our own giant planets very well. The other thing it doesn't seem to explain very well is um, the presence in Kepler data of what appears to be a peak in the frequency of extrasolar giant planets, not at the mass of Jupiter, or I should say the size of Jupiter, because this is number versus size. Uh, this is in um, Earth radii now. So this is 5 Earth radii, 10 Earth radii, 20 Earth radii. Of course, Kepler is observing transits, so it's observing uh, the radius. And um, this is from the Baruch et al. 2011 paper. If this holds up, it suggests that there are a lot of Uranus and Neptune-sized bodies present in orbits around main sequence type stars. How do you get Uranus and Neptune-sized bodies? Well, if these have the density of Uranus and Neptune, we don't know if they do, uh, then they're kind of a mixture of rock and ice and some gas. And the easiest way to form them is to run the core accretion models so slowly that they essentially get stranded without enough gas to be Jupiters and Saturns. Leaving aside the question of migration for the moment. Um, of course, we don't know what the densities of most of these objects are. The ones for which there are densities, some of them are kind of consistent with Uranus and Neptune density objects. So the argument may hold. So one might say weakly that this is an argument in favor of core accretion. Ultimately, we can test these models if we have um, the ability uh, to do two things. One is to measure the, uh, the size of the cores of Jupiter and Saturn. And as I said, uh, if all goes well, that will be done in 2016 and 2017 by Juno and by the Cassini uh, Proximal Orbit mission. For the disk instability model, Another way to test that model is to look for free-floating planets because the disk instability model produces a lot of Jovian and larger mass planets that are ejected from the disk early on and end up as free-floating planets. Now, it is argued by the people who are designing microlensing, space-based microlensing missions, that they are actually able to detect the microlensing signature from free-floating planets that is, this is not the signature on top of the broad microlensing curve that you get from the parent star, where the planet then is a blip on the side of that. It's a single small blip that's consistent with a planet. Now, whether this, uh, we'll talk some more about this possibility later in the week, whether this would be believable or not uh, is, is, a, is a matter of debate, obviously. But the disk instability model will produce a large population of free-floating planets, potentially something like 20% or even more of the giant planets that are produced, if they're produced in this way, would be gone, would be ejected into the galaxy. Okay, so this is really the question. We'd like to know, um, of course, in our own solar system, um, how long it takes for Jupiter and Saturn to form. Constraining their time scale might actually be useful in understanding the time scale for, um, in, in, in understanding whether in fact they formed very, very quickly or whether they took uh, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years even to form. If we knew that they took millions of years to form, that would support the disk, that would support the core accretion model, the nucleated instability model where ice and rock condense out together. Uh, and it would also say that somehow they avoided, by some process, uh, migration on 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 year time scales. So we'd like to have some kind of absolute test of that. Now, um, that's the next part of this talk, is to describe that test. But since I've already gone on for 45 minutes, I think I'm going to save that for tomorrow morning so that I end on time, uh, so that the next speaker can start at 6. Uh, and so instead I'll take questions. So we'll start out tomorrow. This is a kind of a separate little standalone piece. So it's fine to start it tomorrow morning and that way I won't be rushed. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, see if there are any questions at this point.
course, if there aren't, I'll take five minutes to discuss the Iapetus test. Yes? In these vibration models, where does the angular momentum go? Into the disk. Because the gaseous disk is still there. And particularly in the case um, where, well, in both type 1 and type 2 migration, uh, the disk still contains a large fraction of the mass of the forming planets. And so the angular momentum is dumped into the disk and, and any other planets that are nearby as well. So that giant planet moves in and uh, sometimes it can move out, but if it moves in, um, disk material and other planets that are embedded in the disk may move outward. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, the test for dispersibility is the number of revolting planets, but if we imagine that in the core equation we can form uh, seven giant planets, then the outcome would be the same. I mean, is it really uh, a test of the core equation versus distance instability, or is it a test that we can form many planets? Okay, so um, the question is, what is this really a test of, the free-floating planet? So it, it is, I think, as you say, really a test of very efficient giant planet formation versus inefficient giant planet formation. And efficient giant planet formation in which you can have giant planets that are relatively closely spaced to each other uh, versus a situation where uh, giant planets are well spaced because their feeding zones have to be well spaced from each other. So core accretion tends to produce well spaced giant planets on circular orbits uh, in a disk that is already dissipating. The disk instability model produces giant planets anywhere in principle closely spaced on similar orbits uh, generating waves and dumping momentum on each other uh, in a very dynamically active situation. So yes, in fact, what one is really testing is a dynamically unstable situation versus a dynamically stable, but I would argue that the disk instability model tends to produce dynamically unstable configurations, whereas the core accretion model does not. Yes? Could you comment on the fact that many of these hot jupiters are found on Having time orbits by the Rosten and Rosten impact. How does this change the disk migration? Yeah. Uh, oh, so uh, what I what I like to comment on the fact that uh, some of these giant planets, many of these giant planets, are found on highly inclined orbits. We know they're inclined by the McLaughlin-Rossiter effect, um, which we'll talk about later in the week. Um, so how does that? What is that? What does that imply for migration, basically? Uh, and you know, the answer, I think, is that um, it, it, it has to imply that um, uh, there were substantial dynamical, again, dynamical interactions with other large bodies rather than just with the disk itself. Because it's hard in interacting with the disk, particularly the inner part of the disk, to generate large excursions in, in inclination. And so that those, again, I think, also argue uh, in favor of a disk instability <coughs> formation because the disk instability model tends to produce a lot of giant planets that can then interact with each other. Yes? Uh, about, uh, <coughs> oh good, someone is, yes. Uh, uh, bands from uh, you mentioned that it might be hard to form planets in a disk up to 20 the masses. But part of the fact that we do also, we do know that we form ground balls by gravitational collapse of dense holes, dense molecular holes, down to three, five hundred masses. I mean, there is a high, a, a big overlap in the main, in mass, where you could find those ground balls on the planets. Yes, so I guess my first response would be a question back to you. So those objects that are three or five Jupiter masses, why are you calling them brown dwarfs and not planets? I mean, if they formed by a dynamic instability process, did they form uh, in a disk or did they form directly out of the collapsing clump, core clump? We don't know that, right? So I, I, I guess we don't know, but if we don't know, I mean, we can just say we don't know. We don't know. So I think that, you know, to be, to be fair about this, the disk instability model is really just um, a version of the direct fragmentation of a 
a brown dwarf mass body during the molecular cloud core clump collapse, during the collapse of the clump itself. But in the case in which a disk has already been, been spun out, essentially. Um, now, you know, there was a lot of, of, of discussion in the literature in the, in the 1980s about what the minimum mass was in the collapsing clump itself, whether you could make brown dwarfs. And there do seem to be binary star or binary brown dwarf pairs. Uh, you do see that, which implies that these were situations where there was a collapse of the clump with a higher than average angular momentum and the clump fragmented into two pieces that were the mass of brown dwarfs or one was an M dwarf and one was a brown dwarf. And, and I agree with you that there should be an overlap and perhaps a continuum because the angular momentum distribution is going to have a continuum as well. So um, I sort of imagine that at this point, uh, and especially given the argument I'll make tomorrow morning, that we have to accept the notion that bodies that are self-gravitating hydrogen helium spheres actually form in at least three different ways. They form by core accretion, they form by disk instability in the disk itself, and they form by fragmentation of the collapsing clump. And, you know, the, the bias is toward the higher masses for the collapsing clump, the bias is toward the lower masses, of course, for the core accretion model, but they have to overlap with each other. And, and also given the fact that we seem to find planets in almost every part of parameter space that they're looked for, nature seems to want to produce planets in any way that one possibly can. So that's another reason why I like the deuterium burning limit as the criterion, because it has nothing to do with formation. It's just assigning a different name to something that has destroyed its helium, its, its deuterium, by fusion uh, versus uh, something like Jupiter that just doesn't undergo that kind of modification. But it's arbitrary, obviously. So why don't you put another name for the optic that and all the other... Lithium's not so important. <laughs> yes? Uh, you mentioned that the the distribution of the eccentricity is in, is in better agreement with uh, the disk instability model. Is there no way to account for the distribution of eccentricities in the core formation model, <coughs> for example, if the disk is uh, thick? Well, the distribution of eccentricity, I mean, one way to do it in the core accretion model is if the core accretion process were actually quite efficient, so that you were making um, you were making giant planets in this way and moving them in through the disk by migration, then you might actually have them piling up toward the inner edge of the disk. And then they have to dynamically interact. And of course you would end up with perhaps exactly the same uh, situation in the end. So actually, um, probably the distribution of inclinations would be a better argument than the distribution of eccentricities. And it really depends on how efficient uh, you know, core accretion is and how much migration occurs. So, you know, I would say that that's a, probably a very weak argument in favor of, of uh, dynamic, uh, the, the disk instability model. It's not a very compelling argument. Good. Okay, so I think we should stop and um, uh, we can take more questions about this tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>